Does being connected cost us our humanity? It's something that we've been talking about quite a bit in the media lately. It's hard to see someone on their smartphone and not think to yourself, hmm, they're not paying attention. They're not really in the moment. For the past two years, I've spent a little bit of time in the media myself. And it's something I wasn't ready for. You get asked a lot of interesting questions when you're the world's most connected person. Some things aren't very appropriate. But data and being connected always leads us to a bigger question, surveillance. You see, there's a difference <laughs> when you're called the world's most connected person than when a teenager refers to you as a robot from the future. <laughs> For me, this really comes down to answering one fundamental question. Is there a difference between big brother and big mother? Could you use the information that you create every day to make your life fundamentally better? For me, the answer was yes. But it started with my big mother, who wasn't always so big. My mother was Priscilla Dancy. She was born in 1943, and I'm sure like a lot of little girls, <laughs> she was excited, vibrant, and full of joy. But like a lot of sad things you hear in life, that was cut short for her. By the age of 10, my mother had lost her father, my grandfather, Gregory, to suicide. I can't imagine what it would be like to lose a parent at such a, son, such a young age. I had both of mine for a very long time. Unfortunately, my mother's story got a little bit sadder, because a year later, she lost her mother to brain cancer right before Christmas. My mother was then raised by neighbors. It's unfortunate. I can't even imagine what she'd been through, and she never really talked about it. I didn't find a lot of this out until I was an adult. But my mother made it, like people always do. We're resilient that way. She became a nurse and met my father in upstate New York. His name was Charles. He was in the Navy. And they moved to Maryland, where I was born, in 1968. And by the way, I'm going to live until I'm 50, or uh, I'm sorry, until uh, 2050. Uh, <laughs> Life got busy for my mom and my dad, and they both worked a lot. We were really, really living hand to mouth and actually homeless once. By 1982, I was in high school, and my mom was working two jobs, sometimes three jobs, to keep things going. And I knew I was different because we weren't allowed to play at my house because I was that kid with the family who was never home. No adults, no supervision, although we tried. Between 1980 and the early 2000s, right after I turned 30, life got really busy for me. I went from being a kind of awkward teenager to a really stressed out adult trying and experimenting with a lot of things that are probably less than appropriate. I wrote my mom this email in 2001, and I told her I was really struggling. I had lost track of my health. I was weighed almost 310 pounds. I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I was having sex with anybody I could meet. Um, <laughs> that's what you do when you're young. Um, <laughs> And I just had no real comprehension of like, what was going on in my life. And my mom took a while, a few months, and wrote me back and told me that she really wanted to help me and support my journey. And she was going to do so, but I had to hang on. And in that time, she wrote me letters monthly. My mom still wasn't very good at email at that point. A year to that date, right before Christmas, a big box came to the house. And I was told not to open the box, and my roommate took the box and hid it. Christmas morning came, and there were instructions to call my mom and let her talk to me as I opened the box. So as I opened the box and had my mom on the phone, she said, lift out book one, only book one, and save the other two books until I explain this to you. As I opened book one and started to read the hundreds of pages, I realized that my mother had spent the first 25 years of my life documenting every single moment that she could remember or recorded at the time and put them in date order. Everything from band-aids to report cards, love letters to I hate you letters. My mom had saved. It was overwhelming for me. I remember sitting on the floor crying. I couldn't believe my mom had taken this much time because I didn't remember seeing much of my mom. 
But a lot like my mom, I lost my mom a year later, right before Christmas. But my mom knew that I needed a big picture. You see, some things require long-term thinking. I needed to have perspective over my entire life. So with that in mind, I made a conscious decision in 2008 to do something radical. I decided to never go offline. I wanted to do what my mom did for me, but for my family and the people I would know. To do that, I had to really explore some fundamental things about my personality. You see, inside these devices we use every day are our personalities. And if you think about I Dream of Jeannie, if you, were in the, if you remember this television show from the 1970s, Jeannie never wanted to go to her bottle, but once she got in her bottle, she loved it. The problem is, our bottles contain all the information about who we are. So all of this information was about me in the system, everything from how much I spent, to who I hung out with, to what I talked about, to what I was eating, to the, the to pictures I was taking of everything. But I couldn't see it. There was no easy way to look at my phone. The irony is, if you take your phone and you turn it off, you can see yourself. <laughs> but the minute you turn your phone on, you disappear. So I wanted to fix that. So I started cataloging my life and putting it into little photos I shared with my friends. Some of the earliest photos were just simple things, like the weather, the song I was listening to, and the pitch I was looking at. But this is me in Vienna, <laughs> riding a Segway, going 9.1 miles per hour in all the places I visit. So my pictures have gotten much more elaborate. The next thing really was perspective. You see, Nintendo, the video games, had it all figured out a long time ago. Because they would tell you, everything not saved will be lost. <laughs> and I realized we were taking our entire lives and putting them in things and losing them. Hundreds of photos on our phones that we never look at. The Japanese actually have something called the Tsunami Stone in this village. It's been there for over 600 years. And it says, don't build on or around this spot, or else you'll be wiped out by a tsunami. And they did. They built right over it, and they were wiped out. You see, the Japanese had their own term of long, their own way of having long-term thinking. But digitally, things are very precarious for us right now. Because if you go, some of the oldest human writings are in caves from 20, 30,000 years ago. Stone and papyrus over 2,000 years. Books are over 500 years old. These things, while we don't have a lot of it, we still have some of it. If you can find a floppy drive, a floppy will last maybe 15 years. A lot of formats that you create on computers are already unusable. The TED page doesn't look anything like it does, and almost every web page on the internet is deleted or changed every 100 days. You see, your digital life is a lot like the Ark of the Covenant. I'm not the world's most connected person. I'm the world's most documented person. I can prove I was here last week. Can you? You see, every time you use something digital, you're dissolving right in front of your eyes. There's no perspective. You live in a relentless now. That's why you always feel busy. It is why it's never enough. There's always something new to learn. There's no incentive to go slow. Finally, I wanted to tackle the health issue. I went to my doctor, who I knew and loved, but he had lots of information and knew nothing about me. A chart this thick, and he would never look at it. So I asked him for it, and I scanned it, and then I had it transcribed, and then I had all my lab results put in spreadsheets. So that's one heck of a pivot chart. From there, I went to patient communities online and found other people who were worried about getting sick, the worried well. See, the worried well have a unique uh, perspective on life. They're not sick yet, but they're worried about getting sick. So they spend their constant cycles all around, Do, have I developed something yet? Have I developed something yet? And I was one of these people. Before I would take a prescription, I would develop all the side effects. I would like, read them, oh, I'm heartbeat. I haven't taken the pill yet. <laughs> and like a lot of people today, I started putting sensors on my body. I then divided everything into three areas. Soft data is what I constructed, my identity, who I pretended to be in social media. The pictures of the fabulous trips to Austria I would put on Facebook, or the tweets about the fabulous famous people I just hung out with. Hard data is trickier to, to manipulate. So that's me coming online, and it's hard to really fake my heart rate. It is what it is. The lights are the brightness they are, and the sound is what it is, unless we're absolutely Right? And then you've got core data, genetics, blood work, 
These three types of data weave together to really help you understand a holistic picture of yourself if you can get that data out of your phone and out of your systems. So I put $10,000 worth of equipment on my body, $20,000 worth of equipment in my home. But the shocking thing is, it only cost about $5,000 to do that. The other $25,000 was in the services to buy my own information back. Because these devices are cheap. Your life, incalculable. I then moved it all through a system, everything from finance to faith, health to entertainment. If I was eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, was I listening to Madonna? You know, what was it? What were the patterns I could find? And then I moved it all to a calendar. My calendar is very busy, but I'm not doing a whole lot. The neat thing about looking at my life in this way is I can see everything. The color codes go right back to the type of activity. I can tell you exactly how I felt at any given moment, who I was with, what I was listening to. And you can do amazing things with that information. You owe it to yourself to be your own Wikipedia. You really do. Did I learn anything from all this? I learned a lot. First, the value of identity. You see, because the technology, it changes us. We can't help it. We become the tools we use. That hammer that smashed that glass earlier became the hammer, right? Have you ever gone to a grocery store and scanned groceries? And then if someone walks up next to you, you start to actually try not to make a mistake because you don't want to be judged for not scanning a banana just right. Or you don't want that person to have to come over and scold you because that light's going off because you made a mistake. Or you and three of your friends contort your whole body to take a selfie. Or you become Lion King to get a signal. <laughs> if you've contorted your body for technology, the robot takeover you fear happened in the past. This probably says it best. The card reader at the gas pump won't read my card. Now I have to go inside and pay like a poor person. <laughs> you see, we imprint on the systems we use. It's not enough that we don't save our lives. We become the computer. We're all just walking, talking web pages. And we only want to deal with people who act like the internet. Do you answer me like Google? Do you talk like Twitter? Do you photograph me like Instagram? You see, you become what you bend into. And finally, perspective. There's so much value in it. Very few applications give it to you. The fitness bands today are probably a craze, not because they let you see how much activity you get, but they let you see time, how many steps you took, how long it took you to go someplace. We can actually see time in these things. For my mother, this perspective was so important, and it was so important for changing my life. And what I found, was resilience was the act of perpetual perspective, using these systems constantly to give you more information about who you were in real time. And this feedback is immeasurable. I can tell you from doing this for six years. Because not only did I quit smoking and stop drinking, I still like to sleep around, <laughs> but I lost 120 pounds. And I did that by saying, Days that are over 3,500 calories have these people, places, or things. Days that have under 3,200 calories have these people and places or things. Now, days that have these things create more days like that. Everything from the lighting in my house to the temperature to my truck to emails to music is all automated to create more days that look healthy. Just with my own information. I'm my own solar power. You see, some things require long-term thinking. And if you're going to use technology constantly, maybe you owe it to yourself to be the best version of you you can. I don't think technology is a bad thing. But I do think we need to really consider how we're using our technology nowadays. We need to stop solving our human problems with more technology and start solving our technology problems with our humanity. Thank you.